What will the world be like after the coronavirus pandemic? That is the question we are all asking ourselves these days. What changes are we going to see in politics, in the economy? We can already tell you about one particular revolution that has accelerated thanks to this pandemic. Yes, we're talking about 3D printing. And I know what you're thinking, how is this news? Some of you may have had a 3D printer at home for years. We've all seen objects made with 3D printing. Logos, keychains. But all of a sudden, there are people in your house who are making respirators that can be used in hospitals. I mean, we've moved on from doing this... ...to this. And at this point, we should applaud everyone who is at home saving lives with their 3D printer. I know there are many of you, and you're really doing an amazing job. But the truth is that the 3D printing revolution has been brewing for a long time. In fact, even before the coronavirus crisis, we had already seen news like this. General Electric is investing 100 million euros in 3D printing, creating 700 new jobs in Bavaria. We're not just talking about individuals with 3D printers at home. 3D printing can change the way we understand manufacturing. Suddenly, it makes sense that many industries that have outsourced to Asia for lower wages will now return to Europe and the United States. New jobs are going to be created and others are going to become obsolete. Think about it. In every crisis, there are winners and there are losers. The Great Recession in 2008 affected many banks, but that's also where the great internet Net titans were forged. LinkedIn went public in 2011, Facebook in 2012, and Twitter in 2013. We've all been witness to the social media boom since then. Consider this example. In 2008, we saw Mark Zuckerberg as a young entrepreneur, a kind of David versus big corporations. Today, he has become Goliath, one of the richest people in the world. Well, something similar can happen in other sectors. Perhaps in 10 years, companies like Stratasys or websites like Thingiverse may be what Facebook is today. So the question is, what are the keys to this revolution? What challenges will 3D printing face in a post-coronavirus world? And more importantly, are we facing a new industrial revolution? Or are we just exaggerating? Well, today we're going to answer these questions, but first, let's take a look at some history. One size fits all. I'm sure everyone knows the name Adam Smith. He is not only one of the most famous economists in history, but he also witnessed the Industrial Revolution firsthand. In his most famous work, The Wealth of Nations, he talks about the production of pins. When Adam Smith was a child, pins were made in craft workshops. I mean, one person was in charge of doing it all. How many pins could he produce? Well, that was about 20 a day. And then came along industrial production. Suddenly, factories hire workers, specialized workers for each task who don't have to waste time changing jobs, and more and more machines are also being brought in. So Adam Smith recounts how work is divided in the factory. One worker stretches the wire, another straightens it, a third cuts it into equal pieces, a fourth makes the tip, and so on. Anyway, the task of making a pin happens to take 18 different operations, some performed by the same worker. In this way, Adam Smith highlights how, with the Industrial Revolution, it is possible for 10 workers to manufacture about 48,000 pins a day, or 4,800 per person, instead of 20. all of this progress in just a few decades. We're not just talking about pins. We can apply the same theory to all other products, clothes, food, tools. But not only that, think about the change in mindset we're talking about here. Before the Industrial Revolution, anyone could set up a pin shop. They just needed a forge and some tools. The problem? The production cost of each pin was very high. The Industrial Revolution meant turning the tables. Suddenly, setting up a factory required a lot of initial investment, because you have to buy modern machines, hire workers, etc. But the advantage? Well, that's being able to produce 48,000 pins in a single day. That is, the unit cost of each pin is much lower. You even get to a point where it almost costs you the same to produce 50,000 pins as it does 60,000. However, industrial production does have a disadvantage, which is that everything it produces is the same. Of course, at the same time, that's also a positive. Mass production is something that has defined the mentality of the contemporary era. Mass culture is the most democratic thing that there is. And soda production proved it in the 19th century, when soda, sparkling water, was drunk the same way as Coca-Cola is drunk now. The 
The crowning merit of soda water is its democracy. The millionaire may drink champagne while the poor man drinks beer, but they both drink soda water. Mary Gay Humphreys, American sociologist, 1981. That's the same thing today. The Coca-Cola that Mark Zuckerberg drinks is the same Coca-Cola you drink. In short, mass production and the industrial revolution have been positive in many ways, not just in the field of economics. But wait a minute, because not all sectors are the same. Not all industries can produce thousands of copies of the same product. And no, we're not just talking about luxury goods. For example, planes. More or less everyone can drive a car. However, relatively few people fly planes. To give you an idea, the largest car factory in Spain is the Seat factory in Barcelona. It's capable of producing 1,300 cars a day. The world's largest aircraft manufacturer is Airbus, and of course, Airbus doesn't pump out that many planes a day, mostly because they wouldn't be able to sell them. Exclusive. Airbus beats goal with 863 jet deliveries in 2019, ousts Boeing from top spot. But hold on a moment, because today there are other sectors with a more artisanal rather than industrial character. And this is the case in the health sector. Doctors and dentists need parts tailored to their patients. This is the case with prosthesis, widely used when joints such as the hip or shoulder are broken. It's also true for orthodontists working with crowns and dental bridges as well as braces. So we're talking about parts that are not produced by an industrial method. Of course, they use modern technology, but there's no point in making thousands of copies as the fit needs to be tailored to the individual. And that creates a lot of problems. For example, in the case of aviation, in many cases it would be great if Airbus could use their own parts. For example, they might have their own screws, but since it is not cost effective to manufacture screws for just one particular aircraft model, Airbus has to buy generic screws. Screws that can be found on the market that have been mass produced. The well, the plane ends up weighing a lot more than it should, and that translates into higher fuel consumption. However, all of this is about to change. How? Well, let's take a look at that. The New Industrial Revolution It all started in 1988 with a gentleman named Scott Crum. This guy was at his house one day and he said, I'm going to make my daughter a toy frog. He had a thermal fuse gun that many of us used when we were younger during tech classes. But instead of using glue, he put a mixture of polyethylene and wax together and devoted himself to pouring several layers until he had created the frog figure. But he didn't finish there. He designed an entire system to automate the process. This is how the first 3D printer was born. Four years later, Scott Crumb set up his own Stratasys company, which already has more than 600 patents within the field of 3D printing. But before we go any further, think about the change of mindset that this entails. So far, almost all methods for making a part are based on what is called subtractive manufacturing fabrication. For example, imagine that we want to make a part from titanium. Well, we need a titanium bar and a milling machine. The milling machine gradually smooths the metal piece until the part is obtained. In this way, the machine removes all the titanium that we don't need. In other words, there's a lot of metal being discarded. 3D printing is the opposite. That's why it's called additive fabrication. In this case, we deposit material right where we need it. The difference is not only noticeable in cost, but also in the design of the piece itself. Most metal and plastic parts are designed to be manufactured, which means that they can contain extra material than is needed for its function, but that is necessary for the manufacture of the final product. However, with 3D printing, we can make parts up to 60% lighter, but just as resistant. And you might be thinking, is this really that important? Well, let's go back to planes. Lighter parts mean lighter planes that consume less fuel. To give you an idea, for every kilo of weight that we reduce on a plane, we're saving about $3,000 a year. And I know what a lot of you have got to be thinking. Why haven't we heard of this before? That is, if 3D printing was born in the late 80s, why is it only recently that these printers have started to be used widely? Well, because of a patent issue. The patent that makes domestic printers possible expired in 2009. That is, it was only from 2009 that home 3D printers could be manufactured without having to pay Stratasys. And this explains news headlines like this. Half million 3D printers sold in 2017, on track for 100 million sold in 2030. But the real revolution is not in home printers, so let's talk about the big printers, the ones that cost tens of thousands of dollars. The system is the same as the domestic one, but on a massive scale. 
Suddenly, we can make custom airplane parts or medical prostheses, and we can do this with a lot of precision. In other words, 3D printing brings together the best of both worlds, unique pieces as if made by an artisan, but with the precision of a machine. As you can see, we're no longer talking about making a figurine to decorate your desk, we're talking about big things. And that's already starting to come a reality. Take a look at this. 3D printing applied to MRO of FA-18 Hornet by US Marines. We're talking about a United States base in Japan where they're printing parts to repair an airplane. Imagine the cost and time savings of making the spare part yourself instead of ordering it from the US production factory. And we're not just talking about planes. For example, think of dentists. In Madrid, there are actually already dental clinics that can have your new dental crown tailor-made to your mouth within 24 hours. How do they make it so quick? Well, that's because they have their own prosthetic lab. There's no middleman. They can say, goodbye to all logistics costs. But we can go even further. Let's have a look at the textile industry. Have you ever heard of fast fashion? I'm sure you've seen ads on Facebook for brands like ASOS or Boohoo. These clothing brands are competing with giants like H&M and Zara because they have a totally different strategy. Big clothing brands design a type of shirt or dress and make thousands of copies. That's how they keep the unit costs down. The problem is that if you launch a shirt design that doesn't sell, all those thousands of copies you've made have to be thrown away. However, these new brands bring out a range of designs and very few copies of each. They test the product in the market, and once they've seen which shirts sell the most, that's when they produce more copies. In other words, it seems that in the next 10 years, the fashion industry could also change. And that's all very well, but in every revolution, there's going to be losers. So what is the biggest problem facing 3D printing? Well, let's take a look at that right now. Pirating Mickey Mouse Airbus is, along with Boeing, the largest aviation giant. However, do you know how many factories it has in South America? Well, take a look at this map. Exactly, there are none. Now imagine that the Chilean airline LATAM asked Airbus for a spare part. Think about how easy it would be for Airbus to send the 3D file of the part to be printed at FIDEA, the Argentine state-owned company that is responsible for the maintenance of Airbus in the region. If that were the case, Airbus might not need to have two logistic centers in Argentina and Brazil. However, with all of this ability to share files, the same thing might happen as happens with music. Until the 1990s, piracy hardly existed. Of course, your friend could have a Spice Girl CD that you copy onto a cassette, but if you wanted to have a specific CD that none of your friends had, you had to go to the store. However, all of this changed with the internet. Suddenly, your friends no longer needed to lend you the Spice Girls album, but instead just uploaded to Emule for millions of people to download. This was the end of many record companies. Well, imagine what would happen to industrial property. I mean, imagine someone uploading the design of a piece that lots of engineers have been working on. We're not just talking about piracy, we're talking about industrial espionage here. Don't believe me? Well, check this out. MIT educated engineer and a Chinese businessman are charged with conspiring to steal trade secrets from General Electric to benefit China and hiding data in picture of a sunset. Indeed, there are already a lot of anti-piracy laws that protect industrial secrecy. But how can we prevent someone from copying a file? It's really easy to do. And we're not just talking about technology. Imagine that I take a Mickey Mouse figurine and instead of buying it, I scan it and upload it to a website for anyone to print. Well, Disney is already taking steps to prevent this. Disney files patent application for anti-scanning material that would make figurines harder to scan and 3D print. It is also true that Disney has adapted to the new situation. And in addition to selling you the ready-made figurine, they also sell you the 3D design. However, we will have to see what happens in the future, as the legislation will have to be adapted to protect copyright. Anyway, everything is constantly changing, and it is likely that we will soon hear more from those that want to ban 3D printing or regulate it completely because jobs are being lost. But we have to realize something. It is a revolution that can also save lives. 3D bioprinted cancer model to test anti-cancer drugs. And now the question's over to you. How do you think 3D printing is going to change the world? What new business models are going to emerge? Well, leave your answer in the comments below, and I really do hope you enjoyed this video. Please do hit like if you did, and don't forget to subscribe for brand new videos. Please do check out our friends at the Reconsider Media Podcast who provided all of the vocals in this episode that were not mine. Thank you for watching. And if you want to learn more about politics and hear even more of my lovely voice, you can join us at Reconsider Media. We have a podcast at reconsidermedia.com slash podcast. See you there.